So welcome or welcome back if you're joining us for another great garden conversation. Thanks for being with us today. Our conversation today is all about water wise gardening. And so for the next hour or so, we'll be covering some watering smart techniques and discovering some wonderful plants that can thrive in these tough conditions. My name is Kathleen Hennessy, and I work with Monrovia's PR agency, Axiom Marketing. Before we meet the Monrovia team, I just have a few things that I need to pass along with you. We are recording this talk today, but don't worry, we can't see or hear you and your cameras are turned off and your microphones are muted. But we don't want we don't want that to prevent you from participating. You can ask questions throughout the presentation in the Q&A box at the bottom or the top of your screen, depending on your view with Zoom. We have a few Monrovia team members who will be monitoring and answering those questions during the discussion. And we'll have time at the end to take a few and answer them live. If we don't get to answer your question during this event, we will follow up via email. Um, so stay tuned for that. We will also have a second way that you can participate today. At the beginning of the dis discussion, we're going to be asking for your opinion. And that will be coming up in our poll question. If you miss anything during the talk today, we'll be posting this webinar on Monrovia's YouTube channel, and you'll find lots of great videos and discussions on other gardening topics on that channel as well. And we'll also be sending you a link to this conversation in your email shortly after today's discussion. Those are the technical details, so let's get to know our Monrovia experts. I'd like you to meet Katie Tammany. Katie's official title is Chief Marketing Officer at Monrovia, but she's really their chief storyteller and trend spotter. She's the former editor of Sunset Magazine with more than 20 years of experience in lifestyle and leisure industries. She's a longtime avid gardener and resident of California, so she knows a thing or two about water wise gardening. Her favorite new drought tolerant plant is a variety called Joey Improved. Hello, Katie. Hi, Kathleen. Good morning, everybody. I'd also like you to meet Georgia Clay. Georgia is the new plants manager at Monrovia, which really means she's our go-to plant expert. In her role, she works with breeders and plant finders from around the world to bring new plants to market for Monrovia. Part of her job includes trialing and testing these plant varieties. And most of these are tested for several years before they're available for us to shop at a garden center. Georgia's favorite drought tolerant plant is Agastache, and there are some really beautiful color options in this plant, right, Georgia? There are, yeah, there's many to choose from. My favorite being pink and blue, but if yellows are for you, that's great too. <laughs> we'll talk about some more of those today too, which will be great. So again, thank you for joining us today. Katie, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Great, thank you. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, I'm going to pop our presentation up on the screen. Um, and I wanted to add my favorite drought tolerant plant is Joey Improved to Lotus. Um, and it's a plant that's relatively new for us. Um, it's also a great pollinator attractor and um, just really eye catching in the garden. So um, we're going to start with a poll, as uh, Kathleen mentioned. And we want to ask what your biggest challenge is um, in a drought, your biggest gardening challenge. Um, so let us know, is it keeping my plants alive? Is it, you know, the lawn, if you've still got one? Is it choosing water-wise plants that are beautiful and colorful? Or maybe it's getting plants established during a drought? And then last, maybe it's just feeling guilty about gardening, wondering if you're making an ethical choice. So we'll give everybody some time to answer. A lot of them running neck and neck here, it looks like. We've got a lot for, um, you know, keeping plants alive, a lot with choosing the water wise varieties mm -hmm. and getting plants established. Those look like our top three. Great. Well, not surprising. And we're here to talk about all those things today. Um, I think uh, we are um, in conditions that are, oops, that are feel that might feel familiar to um, some of us who have been in the West for a long time. Um, you know, if you grew up as I did in California in the 70s, you remember brown lawns and water restrictions that were quite severe then. But what's different now is that we have uh, also rising temperatures. We have a heat 
issue that's making our drought even worse. And we've been in a drought um, for you know quite a while now. And in, in this map, reflecting you know the recent stats from last week, um, you know seeing words like extreme and exceptional, it's daunting. Uh, water restrictions in California. Southern Utah, Arizona are making um, are going to make lives challenging this summer. Going to make gardening challenging for sure. And I want to say at the outset that um, I myself am uh, constantly scanning um, resources and sites for advice and information and asking other people. And um, we are not saying that we're the experts in all drought um, tolerant gardening, but we do have um, some good tips for you and you know, definitely some wonderful plants to talk about today. We also will, when we send out the recording of this link uh, in the email that will follow to everybody attending, we're gonna list some of our um, favorite resources too, so that you can check those as well on an ongoing basis um, throughout uh, the summer as you're gardening. Um, so let's get into it. Um, we're going to be talking about water saving tips, definitely beautiful plant choices, and really if you still have a lawn we'd like to suggest some great ways to think about alternatives, and then the overall general gardening guidelines um, and maybe what some terms mean. Um, so to start with, I'd like to say that um, you know, during drought um, seasons like we're in, I think there's a rising interest in native plants, which we think, you know, as plant people, that's a, that's wonderful. Um, we also know that you can really have a broader selection of plants if you think climate adaptive, not only native. There's nothing wrong with choosing to grow some climate adaptive um, plants. And by that, I mean plants that um, are not invasive, but are from climates similar to um, what we're experiencing in the West, um, in the West, and many of those are, you know, Mediterranean countries, right? Southern Spain, Southern Italy, Greece. Um, those can be great resources um, for, you know, you to think about design of your landscape, plant choices, um, as well as desert style. And I think you'll be seeing when Georgia goes through some of our plants today, that a lot of breeding that's been done um, with South Africa, Israel, um, Australia, um, can be really meaningful to um, us here in the in the U.S. West, um, and that so much work is being done around drought tolerance, um, right, Georgia? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, your favorite drought tolerant plant is a good example of that, Telotus. Uh -huh. It's an Australian native plant, um, something that hasn't really been available in the marketplace until recently, mm -hmm. um, when breeding work has been done with it because of its drought tolerance and its beauty. So there's a lot of um, new genus being introduced um, that's really exciting. Yeah, and I think sometimes when people say use the word native, they might be thinking more, you know, sustainable Mediterranean climate when they when they use that term truly native plants, um, the selection where you live might be might be more limited than you think. Um, so just think a little broader than that. Um, so to start with what we thought we would do is kind of um, go through some of the, the tips that we have based on certain categories of plants. So I'd like to start with what do I do about my trees during a drought? Now, this is probably one of your most valuable um, landscape investments. Um, so I think in a drought, really paying attention to your trees is going to be really important. Um, and one of the things that I'd like to say with the water restrictions going on, especially in some areas of uh, the West where it's, you know, you can only water once a week, that that's going to be okay for your trees. That a lot of trees, especially if they're established, you can get by with um, more infrequent watering, you know, maybe every two to three weeks, a deep um, soak with a hose. And, you know, you really want those less frequent, deeper soaks because it's making the roots go deeper, you know, where they can you know, really um, will find more moisture on a longer term basis. It keeps the roots from just kind of spreading out on the surface when you do that. Um, so you definitely want to water infrequently and deeply. Um, some wilt and leaf drop, you know, might happen, but that's that's going to be okay. The, the tree is going to survive. I think if you've got um, a younger tree, something maybe that you're still trying to establish, maybe it's one or two years out, you probably are going to need to water more like, you know, one or, or maybe once or twice a week. But still you can do that, I think, with a five-gallon you know, bucket, put that five gallon bucket at the, um, the, you know, the edge of your tree canopy. Um, 
and fill it, you know, have, have uh, holes in the bottom of that bucket, but fill it with water and let that be your, your deep soak on that younger tree. A key point here is that a lot of people still mistakenly water the plant, water their tree close to the base of the tree. But if you've got a, um, you know, like a fig tree, like I have, that's, you know, six, seven feet tall, you really want to, you know, water at the outside at the canopy, that's where the roots are, that's where they, you know, they need water. So that's, you know, an immediate tip to share. Um, and then let's talk a bit about um, some trees, maybe that you should consider um, for your landscape. Uh, Georgia, take it away. Yeah, forgive me, I do have a lot of trees. There's so many good options. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> But That's the first good. up is uh, Leslie Roy Mesquite. Um, this is a hybrid. It's a hybrid between the hardy native mesquite and the thornless Chilean mesquite. Um, and that hybridization results in a thornless desert tree with a higher tolerance to cold temperatures, which is great. You kind of get the best of both worlds. And then of course you have that blue green fern-like foliage um, and a creamy white flower in the spring. And then next to that is another native tree, the desert willow. Uh, desert willows are naturally found growing wild all throughout the mountains of the Southwest United States. Timeless Beauty is a selected variety that blooms prolifically from summer into the fall. Um, the flowers are quite fragrant and um, hummingbirds tend to really like them as well. Um, we really like Timeless Beauty also because it doesn't form any seed or bean pods, so less mess in the garden overall. Um, and next to that is Red Push Pistache. So this is a great specimen tree for fantastic foliage. Um, that new foliage emerges red, hence that name Red Push. It's going to push out red and then gradually turn to this really lush dark green. It has a big, dense, beautiful canopy, so it provides a lot of summer shade, which can be beneficial um, to the garden and to humans just liking to spend some time underneath the shade. Um, and then, of course, as temperatures cool, it's going to also put on really beautiful fall color. So reds, oranges, yellows. Um, and this is another one that doesn't produce fruit. So another great choice for near sidewalks or lawns or streets. And then below that is the Marina strawberry tree. I would say every part of this tree brings some sort of ornamental value to the garden. It has beautiful rosy pink flowers and then bright red and yellow fruits that persist throughout the fall and the winter when not a lot of other things are tending to go on. Um, I really love the bark on the strawberry tree as well. It's this gorgeous, smooth cinnamon color. It's highly ornamental, um, a great plant for those sunny, dry locations, but also salt tolerant, so it can be used on the coast as well. Um, on that tree, Georgia, I have a lot um, in my neighborhood where I am in zone 10, and, and so I want to ask you about the zones, um, because a lot of our plant choices say seven to nine, but, but if I'm a zone 10 gardener, can I you know, push that a little bit. I'm not, you know, I'm not getting the, you know, maybe there's other parts of the country that are zone 10 that have different issues, but for me in California, I could consider that. Yeah, definitely. And that's sort of where things get a little tricky with zones, but I would definitely like Marina strawberry tree for you in California zone 10, it would be a great choice. Yeah. You know, um, there's such difference in humidity levels. Mm -hmm in Miami or you can be in California and have such different zone 10 climate so you know it all just depend but yeah that zone 10 would be great for this plant um, and then chocolate fountain albizia this is uh, the only purple foliage weeping mimosa tree on the market so quite special uh, that purple foliage holds itself really well in the sun and then it adds that wonderful contrast to the delicate like pink flowers that Albizia trees get in the summer. This is also more compact, so it's only going to be about 15 to 20 feet tall. Yeah, I love this. And it also goes with that dark light trend that we've been noticing for a while. But to have a tree that, you know, really um, expresses that is, is it's incredible in the landscape. Yeah, beautiful. And then another one that is one of my favorite new trees to come to the market is this flamethrower redbud. 
Um, the foliage on this plant emerges deep burgundy red, and then it gradually ages through these shades of amber and bright yellow and greens. Um, you get this multi-tone color display um, throughout the season. Oftentimes on this plant, you'll get four or five different colors on a single branch at one time. Um, no photo does it justice. It's such a beautiful plant in person. Um, it's also it's a small tree, so 15 to 20 feet tall and wide. Um, Eastern red buds are great. They're a North American native. Um, they naturally grow from stream banks to dry, rocky ridges. So they're really extremely adaptable. So tolerate both droughty conditions and wet conditions um, once established. So let's talk about um, what might, you know, be available and appropriate for the Intermountain West, you know, those colder zones that are still dealing with a lot of drought. You've got some really beautiful selections here. Right, so we'll start with ginkgo. Ginkgos are super cool trees, uh, traced back to more than 150 million years ago. So they're thought of as the, the living fossil in the tree world. Uh, jade butterfly is a dwarf selection. So it matures to just about 12 to 15 feet tall by 10 feet wide. Um, bright, brilliant green foliage, and it's gonna turn golden yellow in the fall. This is a male cultivar, so it doesn't produce that sort of stinky fruit that ginkgos tend to get a bad uh, reputation for. <laughs> and then next to that is Tolleson's Blue Weeping Juniper. This is a great plant for that um, high desert, intermountain west, droughty conditions. It's a super unusual evergreen conifer with those weeping branches and that soft blue-green foliage. Um, it can get about 20 feet tall or so by 10 feet wide and just a really unusual, super cold hardy specimen plant. And then next to that is Andean Gold Austrian Pine. This is a slower grower, so more compact than typical Pinus nigra. It's going to be about 30 feet tall or so at max in the landscape. We selected Andean Gold for its bright yellow new growth, which makes it just a really special landscape specimen. Um, Pinus nigra also can tolerate poor soils and really harsh drying winds, mm -hmm. um, making it a really awesome windbreak choice for those droughty high desert areas. Thank you. I think uh, before we leave trees, I just wanted to say another tip is to I would avoid pruning during the drought, avoid over pruning for sure, because you know that can stress out. Um, your tree unnecessarily, um, but great selections, George. And now let's move on to edibles. Um, so can I still grow, you know, at an edible garden um, during a drought? And the answer is yes. You might want to, you know, think about not growing some of those vegetables that maybe you've grown in the past that require a lot of water, but we've got um, a lot of tree and shrub uh, options for you to consider. And I think Number one is maybe this year only grow, you know, what you're actually going to eat. This is not the season to overdo. Um, and to pay attention to when water is most important in the lifespan of the edible plant that you're growing. So that would be transplanting it and then fruit forming. Um, when fruit forming and flowering is going on, the plant does need, you know, more water. But once that's set, um, you can sort of back off of your water and, um, and, and do more like dry farming once the fruit is set, which will also actually result in, you know, juicier, sometimes more flavorful fruit anyway. Um, I think that uh, the other key thing, if you if you are planting something this season, is to think about wind. I mean, you talked about um, that in the slide that we just shared, Georgia, but having your edible garden in a less windy area, if possible, of your landscape is going to make a difference. Um, I think you also want to fertilize maybe a little bit less. Too much fertilizer, you know, does stress out a plant during during drought. So. Um, and the other thing I would say is we're, we're going to talk, I think, mainly about shrubs and, and trees, but that strawberries can be surprisingly um, drought tolerant. And as a, that's, a, that's a good choice um, as a perennial in the, in the landscape and in, in drought uh, prone areas as well. But moving into the plants, the exciting stuff. <laughs> Yeah, so um, you can see here from this selection, I've chosen a lot of Mediterranean style uh, edibles because they make great uh, plants for those semi-arid climates. So first up is fruiting pomegranate. Um, they produce large orangey red flowers in the summer, and then that fruit is formed by early fall. 
I really love pomegranate because it can be used as a small tree, a large shrub, and it can even be a spoliate if space is an issue or you're trying to work through a, maybe a, a narrow space. It's going to be 10 feet tall and wide. Um, this works great in xeric gardens, but as you mentioned, Katie, the fruit's going to be juicier and, uh, and more flavorful if given that supplemental water during the flowering and fruiting season. But other than that, pretty much uh, no water is really necessary um, supplemental. And then figs are also great for that drier Mediterranean climate. There are many varieties to choose from. Uh, Kadoda has a reputation for doing well in drier, hotter climates. Um, and it does provide that sweet greenish yellow fruit in late summer and fall. And then if you are looking for something a little more hardy, Chicago hardy is known for performing well in colder climates. So one of the hardiest at zone six, but also um, have heard that it can be root hardy in zones five as well. Um, so really nice choices there. And then down below is olives. They also can tolerate heat and drought really well. This variety is Haas Manzanillo Improved, which produces these really large olives with much smaller pits and more flesh than the typical Manzanillo. So a lot of um, bang for your buck with this Haas Improved. Um, it's gonna bloom late spring and it does bloom about a week earlier than the typical Manzanillo. And then uh, grapes also typically don't need a lot of water once they're established, um, but again, they do benefit from that supplemental water during fruit set. Uh, Zestful is a great series for the home gardener. Um, it produces really large table style grapes with great flavor and those table style grapes can sort of be hard to find for the home garden. So the Zestful series is really great for that. And then herbs also can work really well. So rosemary is just one example, but there are many. Um, there are many varieties of rosemary to choose from as well, but barbecue is a favorite for uh, the edible garden gardener and the griller as it produces these really nice um, straight stems that can be used as skewers for grilling your veggies and meat, which is always sort of fun. So uh, yeah, when I, when I look at this uh, screen, I'm seeing, you know, Mediterranean landscapes, um, for sure, which also, you know, the wonderful thing is all these plants go together so nicely, they play well <laughs> together. Um, so third topic, um, you know, there's a typo there, how do I take care of my perennials? Um, and this advice doesn't just go for perennials, really, it's, it's thinking about your garden, um, overall is to mulch, 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 I really can't emphasize enough how important that is. Um, during a drought, especially having about a three inch layer of mulch really helps, um, you know, keep roots cool. It, um, uh, you know, um, keeps, uh, you know, water from evaporating as, as quickly. Um, it, it's just such a nice um, shading of the ground. It also suppresses weed, um, weeds that are going to, you know, also be um, trying to steal water from your plants. So a lot of good uh, benefits to using mulch. And I know a lot of people mulch in spring, but if you haven't already, it's, it's totally fine to mulch now. Um, you want to be careful not to um, build like little mini volcanoes toward the base of a tree or a shrub, you know, you want to leave about six inches from the, the base of those plants. Um, so don't don't just push the mulch right up um, against the plant. That's that's not going to be healthy. Choose a an organic, you know, mulch so that as it breaks down, you know, it's good for the soil. I know farmers are always saying they not only grow plants, but they grow soil. And you should definitely be keeping that in mind as well. Um, taking care of your soil during a drought um, and mulch will help you do that. Um, so let's look at some good contenders if you are going to plant perennials this season. Yes, and again, so many perennials to choose from. I had a hard time, so there's a lot, but um, <laughs> I'll start with Gallardia, uh -huh. um, which are known for their great heat and drought tolerance, also for their tolerance to poor soils. Um, the Barbican series that we're showcasing here has a really nice tidy mounded habit. It's going to be about 18 inches tall and wide. And what I really love is that the blooms sit right above the foliage. So it really looks clean and it provides this continuous color from late spring through summer. It's also an awesome pollinator plant. <laughs> 
And then Nifophia is a, another perennial with great drought resistance. It's native to South Africa and is a great mid border plant. So when it's in bloom, it can reach up to about 30 inches tall. So really nice um, bright spot with short grassy foliage. And then those huge spikes of bright mango orange blooms um, summer into fall. This is another plant, Nifophia or dwarf poker, um, lots of different color options. So whether you love the mango, you can also find it in reds and different colors. Um, Catmint, a super floriferous plant with those fragrant showy flowers, again, blooming from summer into the fall. So a really long bloom season. Um, we're showcasing Junior Walker here, which is a sterile dwarf form of the super popular Walker's Low. It's going to have a much neater habit and ultimately reach about 16 inches tall and about double that wide or so. And then sedums below, sedums of all types are extremely water-wise. Um, conga line is a upright sedum. It's relatively new on the market. It's one of my favorites that we offer. It has this really beautiful multicolored foliage. It shifts from greens and purples to burgundies on the stems. Um, and the stems are also quite sturdy and compact, so they tend not to flop over in the garden. Um, the flowers are also really great for pollinators and they are also multi-toned. So you get that multi-toned foliage and then the flowers are shades of peach and corals and yellows and creams. It's quite beautiful. And then next to that is Agastache. Like we mentioned, it's one of my absolute favorite drought tolerant plants. Um, they are amazingly free flowering and super low maintenance hummingbirds, bees, Tons of pollinators just love Agastache. Um, the Kudo series was bred with a hardy species of Agastache. So um, it not only has a shorter, tidier habit, but it's also a little more hardy than you'd expect. Um, Kudos coral has that beautiful coral color, but as we mentioned previously, there are a lot of colors to choose from in the genus. And then next to that is Gara. Um, Gara has a really nice long taproot that allows it to get water and nutrients from way down deep in the soil, making it incredibly tolerant of drought and poor soils. Um, Gara is typically one of those plants that gets sent to the back of the garden because it gets huge and floppy and sort of wild. Uh, but the Steffi series is really awesome because it's nice and compact and the blooms stay again right above the foliage. So it stays really neat in the garden, only going to be about a foot and a half or two feet tall at maximum. Um, this series, the Steffi series, was also bred in Israel, making it super heat tolerant as a whole. You know, that plant, the Steffi, as well as what you mentioned about Junior Walker, Catmint, you know, it's sort of more compact habit. It really points out to me to the importance of looking for particular varieties. Um, you know, it's not just choose any um, Gaura or Catmint, but maybe find one that is really right for your garden that stays more compact. And, and so it's important to pay attention to what, what breeders are developing and, and um, some newer varieties that kind of suit more of uh, today's gardens. So Yeah, absolutely. Well, Gaura especially, you know, you yeah. could find, a, you could have had a really bad experience with Gaura being quite rangy and right. in the garden, but with this, you wouldn't have that issue. So yeah, I totally agree with you, Katie. Yeah. And then because, you know, six, we, we, we couldn't limit ourselves to six, you, you added three more um, perennials uh, on our list of, of ones to watch, um, you know, this summer. And I, I'm in love with all of these. They're all so beautiful. Yeah. And these ones are um, more for those drier, more desert Southwest, yeah. Southern mm -hmm. California style garden. Um, this first one is a Asclepius linaria or the pine leaf milkweed. Um, mm -hmm. This is native to South Arizona and California. So perfect for gardeners in that area as uh, it's your native host plant for your monarch butterflies. Uh, Monarch magnet is a selection of the species and it was selected for a fuller, denser habit. And it's just a little uh, more attractive as a garden plant as part of your aesthetic garden. Mm -hmm. And then in the middle there is Orange Crush Desert Mallow. This is another desert Southwest native. 
selected for this abundance of beautiful, vibrant orange flowers. It has a super long bloom period and quite a nice habit as well. It's going to be about a foot and a half tall by three or four feet wide. Um, really nice grayish green foliage. And like I mentioned, those flowers are just so intense and such a unique shade of orange. Um, this is a heat loving desert pollinator plant. It can take that hot reflective sun, which there aren't a lot of plants that really do well in those areas and it attracts um, bees and birds. I think it's perfect for a cottage garden and it looks really beautiful with, you know, buttery yellow. Um you know, plants of different different types, um, but that's a great palette for a, a you know, a, a heat loving, dry cottage garden. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then um, another one with a really awesome flower color is the Celebrations Fireworks Anagazanthus. The flowers on this are bright teal with contrasting pinkish red stems. Haven't seen anything quite like this flower. Super cool, such a unique plant. It's to be the star of the garden. This was our first year introducing it and it was just, um, we couldn't keep it at the garden centers. It was just uh, really quite unique. This is another South African native so it can handle really quite tough conditions as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then, uh you know, thinking, still thinking low, not perennials, but thinking about ground covers, um, besides using a lot of mulch um, in your garden, um, I think planting some really good ground covers is another thing to think about, um, that, you know, to keep, keep weeds from overtaking um, your garden um, when you're, you know, not able to water as much, to consider planting some drought tolerant um, ground covers. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of really great ones to choose from. Um, the first being that top left corner there is Hattenberg Orange African Daisy. This is another South African wildflower plant. Um, if you're sensing a theme, the South African plants are really low maintenance and quite beautiful. Uh -huh. um, really huge bright orange flowers in the spring. And then it does have silvery gray foliage. Um, uh, all throughout the year. So it's an excellent choice for ground cover in those rock gardens, can even, even handle sandy coastal slopes. If that's something that you're dealing with, this would be a great option as well. And then next to that is one of my favorites, I think maybe Thai for Agastache, I'm not quite sure, is um, Marion Samson Monardella. What an uh, eye catcher, yeah. <laughs> So beautiful. Yeah, it's um, this is a native to the high mountains of California and then all the way down to Baja. Um, so really tolerant of poor soils, quite hardy at zones five. Um, it has those massive two inch long, brilliant scarlet red tubular flowers. And then those sit on top of this low mat of um, shiny foliage that's rather fragrant. The blooms last from spring to fall, so you get quite a long season of blooming interest, and the hummingbirds really do love those tubular flowers. And then uh, Delisperma, this is another hardy succulent ground cover type plant. Delisperma, normally the flowers don't open until about midday, they need that bright afternoon sun to open up and show off their flowers. But early bird, purple, those flowers open in the morning, which is a great attribute for Della Sperma to have. Um, so you just get a more showy plant and you really get to see those really large purple flowers and it does have great flower coverage as well. And then below that, another sedum. This is a ground cover type sedum, Sun Sparkler Dazzleberry. Um, you can see in that photo that really great smoky blue gray foliage. Um, and then it does have late summer clusters of that brilliant, vibrant raspberry flower. Mm. This is always one of the favorites in my garden for the pollinators. They just flock to it. And it's just this really nice carpet of super low maintenance color. And Kanik Kanik is in the middle there. While it might not be the newest plant on this list, um, it's a great evergreen ground cover that I thought was worth mentioning. Mm -hmm. um, zone two, so super cold hardy, northeastern native. It produces these clusters <coughs> of pale pink flowers, and then it has it throughout the winter a nice red berry. So it's lots of seasons of interest with Kanik Kanik. Um, great for hillside erosion control also very drought tolerant. So super easy care and stays nice and low. So about a foot tall, but spreads 
almost 15 feet wide. Wow. So another good choice for like the Intermountain West. Yeah, I believe so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, hens and chicks is last, great for just that architectural element in a ground cover. Super tough plant, um, thrives basically with general neglect. Um, there are many colors to choose from, but this green wheel has that nice cheerful apple green color that we really like. All right, so um, one of the questions that we hear a lot of during drought is what to do about some of you know my favorite, most popular plants, hydrangeas roses, other flowering shrubs. As I mentioned before, you know, mulch, 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 if you're not already doing that. The other thing I would say is that um, backing off on the fertilizer is a good, good idea, you know, this, this season, like take it, take it easy on asking your plant to perform um, so much. And, you know, it's okay to dress, um, you know, with nutritious compost. Watch, I think, for brown edges on the foliage. You may actually be overwatering it with your concern <laughs> if your leaves are, are turning a little bit brown. Um, I have several hydrangeas in my own garden, and I noticed that during the drought, they, they're just, they tend to wilt more at the end of the day, but try to resist the temptation to water right then. You know, you're, you really need to water at the beginning of the day um, to be most effective. Um, and don't, you know, don't get alarmed if your hydrangeas are, are, are wilting a bit. Um, although I think some of the new seaside serenade hydrangeas that have thicker um, leaves, stronger stems are kind of, they're not going to wilt as easily as, um, you know, maybe more of the traditional oak leaf hydrangeas, um, which I have many in my, my uh, garden. If you are watering, let's say like three times a week for 15 minutes, that's your regular routine. Um, try to back off of that, um, water less frequently, maybe even, you know, once a week or twice a week for 15 minutes will be less than doing, you know, that three times a week. And also, again, it'll help your um, roots form more, more deeply um, in the soil. So those would be the, the tips that I would share about hydrangeas and, and roses. The other thing is that roses, especially around where I am in zone 10, they tend to, if, if you've had them for a while, they, they tend to um, stand up to the drought, you know, um, pretty nicely. Um, and uh, it's better, I think, to keep these plants, if, you, if they are established, if you've got a hydrangea that you've had for, let's say, three to five years, it's, it's pretty set. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be okay. You know, like I said, it might wilt a little bit in the afternoon, but, but it's going it, to, it'll, it'll be fine. But other shrubs that you should think about, now's the time. Um, and, and Georgie, you pulled together a really, you know, beautiful color selection here for us. Yeah, so um, the first being Emerald Ice Hotbush, Hotbush um, native to the Sonoran Desert and many other arid, dry regions of the world. Mm -hmm. This Emerald Ice is the first Hotbush clone on the market, which is kind of exciting. And it was selected for its ability to withstand a five degree freeze with minimal damage. Mm -hmm. um, it was the only Hotbush left standing because every other plant around it was killed. So wow. <laughs> much more hardy than the traditional <laughs> um, Hotbush. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an evergreen shrub. It actually makes a great substitute for oleander. Um, it has that same sort of foliage type. Uh, great for hedges and privacy screens. It's going to be about eight to 12 feet tall and wide. And then Little John, which is a compact variety of bottle brush. Uh, it's only going to be about three feet tall by maybe five feet wide or so. Um, brilliant red flower spikes from spring into summer, though in your, if you're in a more temperate region, it's going to bloom on and off throughout the year, most likely. Uh, hummingbird magnet, great for droughty landscapes also. And then icy blue podocarpus, uh, one of our favorites, it's a beautiful conifer for the Southern United States. It was selected for that distinctive blue foliage. It's absolutely gorgeous in the landscape. It's gonna reach about 15 to 20 feet, five feet tall and wide. Um, this is another native to South Africa. Um, it's naturally found in seasonal riverbeds, I believe. So it's pretty adaptable to both dry and moist conditions. Um, and below that is Myrtle. Myrtle is a super useful hedge. Um, Sweet Maroon is very colorful. Um, it has that beautiful green glossy myrtle foliage throughout most of the year, but in the fall and winter, it's gonna turn bright, deep red. Um, this one is also slightly more compact. So four feet tall and wide would make a great foundation shrub or hedge. 
Um, that foliage is quite fragrant and it also produces a fragrant white flower in the spring. And then uh, Budlia, also known for being a tough shrub. This one pictured is Tutti Fruity in the Flutterby Petite series. Um, it was selected for a compact habit. It's going to get about two to three feet tall and wide is all, which is really much more easy to maintain in the yeah. garden than some of those big uh, rangy Budlia of the past. Um, super fragrant flowers and continual blooms. This has shown extremely low fertility. It rarely reseeds itself in the garden. Butterfly bush is one of those that um, can be quite invasive, but this Flutterby Petite series is really great for low fertility. Okay. And then lastly is Bluebeard or Caryopteris. This is a wonderful late summer bloomer, a fantastic pollinator plant. Um, one of my favorite late season bloomers because it provides that abundance of food for your pollinators just when they need it the most at the end of the summer. Um, Labar Blue has yellow foliage that does perform really well in the full sun. It doesn't tend to fade out or burn like a lot of other yellow foliage shrubs can do. And then it really pops against that um, the, the blue flowers really pop against that yellow foliage. Yeah, that's a really striking, striking plant. Um, I wanted to talk about just in general watering and maybe talk a bit with you, Georgia, too, about what we mean when we say getting plants established. Um, but let's first talk about just watering techniques. So water early in the day, um, as I mentioned, um, and uh, you know, resist, even on a really hot day, resist giving your plants maybe that extra drink in the afternoon. Really, if you've watered deeply um, in the morning, that's going to be enough. Don't assume all your plants need the same amount of water, you know, either. And um, if you've got a drip system, set it appropriately. Make sure that your plants are grouped, you know, with similar water needs. But really check your drip um, irrigation system right now. If you haven't already, last spring, um, check for leaks, check for block emitters, check for um, um, where your drip system might be strangling a plant that maybe grew up after you had laid it out. I know that that tends to happen. People install their drip system and then they think, okay, I did it. And then years go by <laughs> and suddenly, you know, it's the, the plant is like literally being strangled by the um, the drip system. So you really want to make sure it's working properly and then evaluate just how much you need to be watering. You know, a lot of the restrictions that are going on right now, asking people to cut back like 20% of their water use. Think about how you might do that with your um, outdoor irrigation. And if you can't do that, if you can't um, step back 20%, um, try to look for opportunities indoors to conserve water, to save water, um, you know, shorter showers, et cetera. You know, I was talking about people who'd gone through the drought in the 70s, remember that era. Um, so try to practice other water conserving measures inside if you're feeling like, you know, you really can't scale back on your watering outside. Um, but I think in most cases, you know, you'll be able to, your plants will get through it more than you think. Um, you know, I think watering to like making sure your soil is, is dry before you water is a good you know rule of thumb so really test you know rather than get into how often just you know you should be watering you know three times a week or two twice a week test your soil dryness and when it's dry to a depth of you know two to four inches okay then you know maybe that's that's your guide that you want to water when it's it dried up like four inches um but in terms of getting plants established georgia we get that question a lot um, I know we have talked about um, how sometimes we'll, we'll tug on a plant to make sure it's established, which you, know, you want to be careful about doing that. But what we mean by um, getting plants established is that the roots have taken hold. They've explored the soil. Um, and, and about how long do you think that takes? Let's say on some of the perennials that you mentioned, it, it's really about... Um, how fast that plant grows in general, right? That could kind of be an indication of how, how quickly that can get established. Yeah, I think it totally depends on the plant. But a yeah. good rule of thumb that I've heard is, you know, a perennial is going to establish quicker than a shrub and a tree, and it might take, you know, a year, maybe slightly less. Um, a good time. That's why they really, we really recommend planting in the fall because mm -hmm. then it can really establish itself well in a, in a less intense time. It doesn't have sure. to establish itself through the heat of the summer. Uh -huh. um, 
But yeah, it definitely depends. But I would say roughly about a year or so for a perennial and maybe two to three for shrubs and trees can be three plus um, depending on the type. So when you're trying to get a plant established during a drought season, actually, as I, as I mentioned, you know, when you have to scale back your watering by 20%, something I keep in mind is that, you know, when you're first transplanting your perennial and they really need to get off to a good start, maybe that first month or so, they need more of a normal watering schedule. But I don't do that with the, the whole drip system of my whole garden. I just do a little extra watering for those new plants using a bucket in my shower <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and hand watering um, to get that plant off to a, an early good start and then backing off, you know, little by little. And I think that plant um, will be fine. It won't be like traditionally established, until after you said after, um, you know, maybe as long as a year, but I think you can, you can plant a new plant during a, a drought season. You just have to kind of think about your watering in a more um, progressive way. Um, okay, so um, let's talk about some things that can take, um, well, some choices in vines and grasses that can take less water. And you've pulled some Great examples that got us thinking, though, about how some drought tolerant um, plants with drought tolerant attributes, sometimes they can be, I don't want to go so far as to say invasive, but well, <laughs> you know, maybe they can get a little bit out of hand, which gives them their drought tolerant quality, especially vines. Um, so it, it was hard for you maybe to choose some, some good ones today to talk about. Yeah, you know, because um, invasive species are so regional and different. Yeah. And a lot of these low maintenance drought tolerant plants, the attributes that make them low maintenance and tough and drought tolerance are the same attributes that can allow them to sort of get out of hand. And um, talking to such a broad audience today, really trying to, to, um, to be aware of those issues within the, the drought tolerant talk. And, and so I found two vines that I felt <laughs> that I felt would be good for for majority of people who were who were listening today. Um, the first being this Burgundy Queen. It's a uh, bougainvillea, a super showy drought tolerant plant, um, really easy to grow and blooms for a very long time. This Burgundy Queen was selected at our Georgia nursery. Uh, it was selected because it has this really beautiful burgundy red new growth and then corresponding burgundy bracts just makes a really super dramatic climber in the garden. And then next to that is the cross vine um, called Tangerine Beauty. It's a heavy flowering, vigorous vine. It's native to the southeastern United States. Um, tangerine Beauty, like the name would suggest, has those gorgeous tangerine blooms with a nice yellow throat. Um, they're really attracted to hummingbirds, as you might guess, looking at that sort of shape of the flower. Mm -hmm. Um, a quite adaptable plant. So it grows and flowers best in full sun, but it can handle some shade um, throughout the, the day if that's what the spot that you need it to be in. Um, and then grasses. Grasses are super important for adding texture as we talk about all the time, Katie, to the garden. Um, and luckily there are quite a few that are drought tolerant. Um, Elijah blue fescue being one of them. It's a nice small ornamental grass. It has that really lovely fine textured silvery blue foliage that holds quite well throughout the year in the summer. And then another great one is blonde ambition blue grandma grass. Um, this is a selected variety of the U.S. native species. I think blue grandma grass is native to something like 28 states in the United States. So a lot of people can grow this. Um, outstanding tolerance to dry heat and thrives in the desert southwest, the intermountain west, and other areas without too much humidity. It's really the only thing that's going to get this is if it has too much humidity. It's probably not um, the right spot. Mm -hmm. um, but the summer flowers are golden and almost flag-like or, or eyebrow-like. Uh -huh. <laughs> they seem to almost bounce in that breeze. They're super fun. 
Yeah. Um, and then black hawks is a big blue stem, another native grass, great for providing that height and color. Um, this black hawks variety is going to emerge deep green and purple, and then will deepen to almost black by the fall. Um, this is a prairie grass. Uh, it needs full sun, but it can adapt to um, a wide range of soils and moisture conditions, including drought. It's a beautiful grass. I, I love that one. Before we move on, um, you know, we were talking about vines and invasives. I did want to make the point that, because um, invasives, I think people are, are very concerned about, you know, not planting something that is going to run, run amok, um, that Monrovia, we don't ship um, plants to places where they would be invasive. Um, you know, you might go to our website and see a plant that, oh my gosh, I can't believe they're growing that, but we're not going to ship that to your region. And we actually work really closely with our garden centers, um, you know, county, state agencies to ensure that we um, are, you know, up on the latest regulations, certainly, but we're also very conservative. Um, even if something is considered somewhat invasive, invasive in parts of a state, we wouldn't ship, ship it to the, you know, anywhere in the, the state. So I just wanted to clarify that yeah. before we yeah. move on. Exactly. Um, so um, the other question we get often is what about containers, you know, in a drought? Um, can I still uh, grow um, plants in containers? And the answer is yes. I think you definitely want to look for heat and sun lovers. Lantana, for instance, on the, on the left is a great one. Um, but think about grouping your containers together um, and maybe um, it, grouping your containers together, which sometimes can help the foliage of containers like shade each, each other. Keep It'll keep the overall containers cooler if you do that. Um, but I think a great um, uh, trick too is add, adding, uh, what do you call it, water-soluble polymers to your container soil. That's a, that's a good way to keep your um, containers from needing to use so much water. The other is to think about succulents um, that look great in containers that really provide that dramatic accent um, that you need and, and are really um, easy care during um, drought. So take us through some of your favorite succulent choices. Yeah, so I've got a, a potpourri of all the different forms that you can sort of get. So the first up is mangave. This is snow leopard. Um, it is one of the mangaves that we are absolutely loving lately. It has these really beautiful deep green foliage and you can see the yellow banding on the outside. Um, it does also have really consistent red spotting throughout all of the foliage. It's a really cool plant. Uh, mangave is a, another hybrid. It's a cross between manfreda and agave, which gives you these really interesting colors and forms that you wouldn't traditionally see together. Um, and then there uh, in the middle is Mount Everest Big Blue Chalk Sticks. Uh, this is a plant that looks fabulous in containers and also in the garden. Um, it has those upward finger-like powdery blue, uh, almost waxy appearance to the foliage. Um, it's a really great contrasting companion to other plants. That silvery blue really does a great job of other things really popping against it. Um, and then aloe is another wonderful option. So I've chosen safari orange, which is a nice mid-sized plant. It'll be about three feet tall or so um, when it's mature. This is a repeat blooming aloe and it has these really gorgeous, big showy spikes of those vibrant orange flowers. Within the safari series, there are other colors. There's also a rose and there's a bicolor as well. So lots of different colors within those safari if orange isn't quite your style. Um, Brake Lights Red Yucca, another great option uh, with extremely low water requirements, has those really bright fire engine red flowers that are held on nice, compact, sturdy flower stalks. Um, they're going to bloom from early spring all the way into the late summer, so you get quite a long season of color. And then next to that is artichoke agave. Um, this is a smaller agave. It's native to Northern Mexico. Um, this can ultimately get about two feet tall and wide. Uh, it's loved for that really cool architectural form and those sort of icy silver blue uh, leaves that add this really cool tone and contrast to containers into the gardens. Mm -hmm. 
And then Echeveria is last. There are many, many, many different types of Echeveria on the market. Um, whether you use, you use them outdoors in containers or indoors as house plants, um, Afterglow is a really lovely one. It has that powdery, soft, lavender pink foliage. And then it does, if you look closely, it has this really nice hint of bright pink along the edge as well. Yeah, it's just luminous. I think a great, great choice for a container. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you're ready to rethink the lawn um, and, uh, you know, because we know drought is going to be with us for the future, too, I think it's an important consideration. Um, now what? And I, one of the reasons I chose to show this garden um, is that it has a lot of great design elements that you can apply if you're thinking about, um, you know, getting rid of the lawn. One is... Um, you can continue to think about shrubs closer to the house, you know, um, we've definitely got a lot of good drought tolerant um, choices for that and then um, still have an accent tree, you know, in your in your um, garden, but you can look for drought tolerant trees to do that as well. And then it's got this really nice tapestry of um, yuccas and grasses and um, agastache and maybe even some cat mint, you know, I see there um, and, you know, without selecting you know, a huge diversity of plants, you can create this really beautiful, soft, lush feeling. And I think you chose a couple of, um, you know, um, plants that were inspired by that, that landscape, Georgia, to think yeah. about that lawn. Yeah, so I picked out a couple of plants that looked like they could be from that photo. Um, the first being the Italian cypress on the left. Um, Italian cypress is such a cool, tall, skinny evergreen. Um, it makes a fabulous accent for that low water garden. Um, they're native to the Eastern Mediterranean and they're grown in so many arid climates around the world. So think Greece and Israel and all these places that are dealing with drought and heat. Um, so great for those of you that experience those same very hot and dry summers. Um, Tiny Tower is really quite um, dense and nice, upright, 25 to 30 feet tall by three feet wide. So really great for adding that nice um, structure to the garden. Um, and then a low maintenance shrub like Nandina might be a good option for a foundation plant or one of those lower growers towards the front that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, this variety that we're showcasing is called Tuscan Flame. It stays nice and compact, so only gets about three to four feet tall and wide. Um, and it keeps that nice, tidy, round habit naturally without the need to prune. So again, just adding to that low maintenance part of the garden, uh, really beautiful reds and corals as well. And then yucca, another easy care plant, perfect for foundation or that architectural interest and those brilliant bright yellow leaves of bright star, so gorgeous and contrasts really well in the garden. Yeah, that's just a stunner. When we drive around the nursery in Visalia, California, that always catches my eye. That finishes our presentation. And we I know we ran a little bit long, but um, I hand it off to you, Kathleen, to see if there's anything else we should answer live. Uh, we have time maybe for just a couple of questions, um, one of which was we had a great question about succulents. And if you plant them outside in a container, can you bring them in in the fall and then bring them back out in the spring? That's what I do. <laughs> I'm in Oregon, so not a lot of succulents can um, overwinter outdoors for me. And so I have good success doing it. I do it with my mangabe every year and um, a couple of my aloes. Um, so yeah, I would think as long as you don't keep them in full time, you know, put them out when it gets warm enough, you should be good to go. Great. One other question that we had a few um, comments on what is the best type of mulch to use? And I know there are so many different options, but maybe if you guys could share your favorites. Uh, well, I mean, I think I, uh, it kind of depends regionally too on where you are, um, but people sometimes use, you know, bark or pine straw or, you know, I just, I, I hesitate to give a, a recommendation. Um, I think I would really look into uh, regionally what's, you know, most appropriate, either, you know, ask your local garden center for their advice. Um, that's one resource. Absolutely. That's great. So I think we should wrap up. We're right at the top of the hour here. So just a reminder that we will post this webinar on Monrovia's YouTube channel shortly, just after our presentation. And all attendees will receive a link to that um, 
to that post on the YouTube channel. And also included in that email will be a list of all the plants that we talked about today. So we appreciate your time. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you, Katie. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks everyone for joining us. Bye.